If you're trying to create aggregates using Entity Framework, or maybe you're writing SQL and not sure how to separate persistence from your domain model, I'm gonna show a couple different ways that aren't usually talked about. Hey everybody, this is Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. So this is probably the most common example I see of Entity Framework being used um, with a repository to kind of create an aggregate. Uh, of a shopping cart and shopping at line items and returning the root, which is the shopping cart. So just to illustrate this, um, I have a, my shopping cart. I have a couple properties here, shopping cart ID, customer ID, and then I have my list of shopping cart items. And then I have my behavior method here that when you try to add an item to your shopping cart, I check to see if you already have that product in your cart. If you do, then I'm just incrementing the quantity which is happening by this method here in the shopping cart item. Otherwise, we're just adding a new shopping cart item uh, to this list. Then the repository, which is again, super typical, is we have the DB context being injected. Then to get out the aggregate root, I'm just basically including, eager loading the items and then get that in, getting out that individual shopping cart ID. And then from there, the caller will use things, whatever behavior methods, I really only have one here for add item, but they'll use all the behavior items, uh, methods that I have to basically interact with this aggregate. The biggest problem I have with this kind of model of doing this is in simple examples like this, this actually works totally fine. I really don't have an issue with this, but a lot of times I see tutorials online and videos and people bending over backwards to get their entities to conform to the way that entity framework needs to work in terms of mappings or adding private constructors or private backing fields because they don't want to expose the public properties because they don't want consumers doing anything with them. And they're doing all these things because just that's the way entity framework works. Now, I don't think you need to go down that road at all. And I think there's alternative ways of doing this. So I'm gonna show you the first way that you can just completely separate what you really want, which is you just want a class that expose, that has behaviors. You just want methods that are gonna interact with your domain model that are things like your add item or whatever other methods that have behavior on them. And you really don't wanna expose data. So here's how you do that. So it's actually really simple to do. The first thing is to create a class that's essentially gonna encapsulate your actual entities. So I have this shopping cart domain. This is not an entity framework entity, it's just a class. But what I'm doing is I'm taking in as parameters to constructor our actual entity framework shopping cart entity. Now this could be, because this entity contains the, the line items itself, I'm just leaving it this way, but you could, if you weren't using includes, includes or navigation properties, you could just accept the line items here as well. Because what you're doing is this add item method that previously was within the shopping cart entity, I removed, and now it's just simply a method within this class. So we're doing our behavior here, and we're essentially just interacting with our entity um, that we have as a private, nothing can touch it. And we're doing all our interactions on that data model. Essentially now we've separated behavior from our data model. Our data model, which was the shopping cart entity, it's just data. All the behavior now is in this separate class and we're encapsulating this piece of data. Then if I go up to the repository, um, it's just fetching out that data using entity framework, just like we were before, but instead of returning it, we're now creating our new shopping cart domain, passing along that data and then returning that to the client. So this eliminates, if you have to do any weird stuff and you're frustrated by all the weird stuff you're doing with your entities to get it to conform to entity framework, don't just separate behaviors and data into two separate things. So I got to take a quick break to talk about repositories here is that when I create repositories, that's generally what they are is what the example that you just seen it's to build an aggregate root and to save an aggregate root. That's it. And especially if your aggregate roots only have essentially commands, things to change behavior, you're not using rep repositories for queries because you're not getting aggregate roots back to do any, reads with or queries with or to create views with. You're only using them for behaviors to change the state of whatever the aggregate is. So repositories, generally in my book, have two methods, a get and a save. That's the end of it. All right, so let's jump back to some code because I actually use a repository in a really great way if you're not using an ORM. 
Now, because Entity Framework is still tracking all the changes, so whatever changes we're making within this class here for adding or updating the quantity, when you call uh, save on the repository, because we had that context, you're going to save changes for whatever, whatever shopping carts we ultimately return. So that's the kind of the benefit of using an ORM is the change tracking. But what happens if you're not using an ORM or you're using a micro ORM where you're ultimately just writing actual SQL? How would you do this? So I haven't seen this mentioned much. And so here's my examples. I have, this is my data model, it's a shopping cart. This is again, not an entity, we're not using an ORM. So I just have the shopping cart ID, uh, the customer ID, uh, my list of items. And we'll notice here that there's some properties missing. So I have the shopping cart ID and the product ID. I'll jump back to this later here, but I do not care about the price and I do not care about the quantity anymore, which is interesting. So if I look at the repository, what I'm gonna do is um, instead of fetching it using our database context, because we're not doing that, I just have an IDB connection and I'm using Dapper um, just to simplify things, micro ORM. So I'm writing my SQL to get back my shopping cart and I'm getting all the line items out. And then basically I'm constructing the shopping cart class here, setting what the line items are and passing that into this shopping cart event domain, I've called it. So the similar type of idea where I'm gonna have a class that's gonna do all the behavior. And what I'm doing is I'm passing in the data to it. Uh, we'll take a look at the save method in a minute. Um, so now my shopping cart event domain is really what you want to do because you don't have a, uh, if you're not using an RM, you don't really have any change tracking. You essentially have to implement that yourself. So what I have here is in my add method, I'm doing kind of similar logic saying, okay, if there's an existing item, then what I want to do is I want to call, uh, event.add. And what I'm doing is I'm essentially creating an event. I'm saying that there's certain, something's happening within my domain and it's gonna be that the quantity's incremented. And then if my item doesn't exist and I need to add a new one, I'm going to add it to my current data model, which is really just used kind of like for internal memory purpose, it's just in memory. Um, so that we can, if another gets called, gets made, we know whether we it exists or not. And I'm doing the same type of thing here. I'm creating another event called item added. So this is just a list of objects that we're storing events that are things that are happening from behaviors. But what we do now is when we call save changes um, or save within our repository, we're gonna pass it back that cart event domain that has those events. And we're gonna start a transaction. We're going to get those events out which is just going to give us our lists of objects. We're going to iterate over them and saying, okay, if it's an item uh, added event, then we're going to execute this method, which is just basically going to perform the SQL that you need to perform. So inserting the current line items. If it's the increment quantity, we will execute SQL to do that type of uh, state change. Um, and then obviously we're still passing the transaction in here, which gets passed into our execute async. So ultimately everything that's run gets run in one transaction and then we commit at the end. So what I mentioned at the very beginning is that I don't care about price and I don't care about quantity is because this particular pieces of which are really just in memory data, I only really need to capture and record the pieces of data that I actually need to use a part of logic. And the only thing I'm using a part of logic is when you add an item, I'm checking to see whether you have that item already in your cart. Uh, I don't care about the quantity because that ultimately ends up in the event, which I'm using to then use in persistence in the repository to save. So this kind of in memory data model, it really only needs the things we only need to record uh, and have things in it that we actually need to use as a part of logic. So it actually kind of slimmed things down a little bit. Uh, in terms of what your actual data model in code is actually going to look like. If you found this helpful, make sure to leave a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. Again, if you're using an RM like Entity Framework or another one, and you find yourself bending over backwards to try to conform to what the ORM needs to do, don't be concerned with separating your behavior and your domain model and what the behaviors are from the actual data model. They can be two separate things they don't need to be one. You can always have your data passed into
your domain model that exposes behaviors. And if you're not using ORM and you're not sure how you're going to do this, really you're using events as your change tracking. You're basically creating events saying what happened, and then you're in your repository, look at those events of what happened, and then have corresponding SQL statements that do the state changes in your database for you. If you want more videos on software architecture and design in .NET, make sure to subscribe. Thanks.